Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for um, coming today. Um, I'm thrilled to be here and to welcome uh, Carol Bove and Josiah McElhenney, I knew I was going to stumble over that name, um, to join me in a conversation about the work of Carlos Scarpa and to discuss the current exhibition. Um, I just, before I begin, I also want to thank two colleagues who are in the audience today, Sheena Wagstaff, who's the chairman of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Met, who was instrumental in bringing this exhibition to the Met and who asked me to oversee it, and Mary Claire McKinley, who worked brilliant, brilliantly with me on the exhibition. So thank you to both of them. And thank you also to Bank of America for sponsoring the event. Um, so just to give you a sense of how today will unfold, I'm going to give um, a 10-minute introduction to the work of Scarpa. And then both Carol and Josiah will give a 10-minute presentation about their work in relation to the work of Scarpa. And then the three of us will um, be involved in a conversation. And then there'll be some time for questions, not statements, but questions, from the audience um, at the very end. Um, so I suppose the first thing to say is why Scarpa at the Met and why now? Um, and just to give you a sense of Scarpa's work for those who are not familiar, and of course he's not particularly well known outside Italy, this exhibition um, surveys his work in glass, uh, where he's um, working with Venini, the, the Venetian company, for a 15-year period between 1932 and 1947, and Scarpa's dates are 1906 to 1978. So this is the kind of first chapter of his career, and I don't want to talk you through the exhibition because you'll have half an hour at the end to go and see the exhibition for yourself, but I'll just give a quick introduction. So um, this surveys this extraordinary 15-year period in collaboration, both with Paolo Venini, who's the owner of the Venini Company, and a range of glass blowers and artisans who work with Scarpa to create these incredible objects that you see. So here is the very beginning, and these are the earliest objects that Scarpa created for Venini around 1932, which are called a bollicine, meaning um, bubble glass. So they have these bubbles in the glass. And then moving through, you see the installation shots of the bollicine glass. And then there's two reasons, I think, why it felt timely to bring uh, the Scarpa exhibition to the Met. It was actually in Venice um, the year before last. Oh, yes, turn your phones off. That's another thing to say. Um, and one is that, obviously, I think there's a very interesting interface between architecture and design that we can discuss in conversation. There's a, there's a kind of um, vague status for Scarpa as an architect. He never fully qualifies as an architect. And he also spends the first 20 years of his career working in design, working with glass. Um, and the other is that many of his vessels, the glass vessels that you see in the exhibition, draw from historical um, sources. And so, for example, this very beautiful um, Marina Romane uh, vessel that you see here basically uh, takes the ancient um, mosaic glass technique. And so this is Scarpa's um, kind of modern reworking of this. And what we were able to do here was to talk to our, our colleagues in Greek and Roman and to borrow these incredible ancient Roman and Greek mosaic glass, which are 2,000 years old, and then to show the way that was then uh, brought back into Venice, and of course, you know, there's a long tradition of glass in Venice on the island of Murano, which is where the Venini glassworks is, and the way this was recuperated in the 18th century. So the way that Scarpa is constantly drawing from history, which will be a, a recurring theme of today, both in terms of the glass and the architecture, and I'm sure we'll touch upon in many points. And I think the incredible thing that you see in the exhibition is just this, this array of objects and how both prolific he was and innovative, and as soon as he's mastered one style, he goes on to do the opposite. So you have the kind of bejeweled Marini Romane, and then here these wonderful um, works called Mezza Filigrana, which means half filigree. And again, this is an ancient, um, essentially Renaissance technique with this very beautiful blown glass to create this very light structure. And then um, something else I hope we'll touch upon today, and um, which I sort of briefly mentioned before, is the relationship in Scarpa's work between, say, glass, between object making and design, between drawing and between architecture. And as I said, he never qualified fully as an architect, and he was given this rather vague um, title as being a professor of architectural drawing. And so we thought it was very important in the exhibition to include these wonderful drawings uh, for the vessels, where you see this is obviously the drawing of an architect. He's thinking about these um, objects in three dimensions. So you have cross sections, views from above, views from the side. And of course, his very um, 
sort of urgent annotations. So at the top, you see ultra urgentissimi, super urgent. Um, so a sense of just the sheer inventiveness and prolificness that's happening um, during this 15-year period. And you see this also in this wonderful um, array of vitrines where you have these r serried rows of silhouettes. And you see, again, how many different types of glass Scarpa was inventing uh, with his collaborators in Venini. And then again, a bit like um, the case of the Marina Romani, which draw from both ancient Roman and uh, 18th century Venetian sources. What you see here in this installation shot is um, on the right-hand side from the maroon vase in the middle, Scarpa's series of works called Chinesi, Chinese vases, and from the mustard vase to the left, um, Chinese celadon porcelain vases from the Asian department of the Met. So again, we were able to juxtapose and show uh, the sources that Scarpa is drawing from. So again, there's always this sense of anachronism in Scarpa's work in both uh, his vessels and his architecture. And again, here you see the way that he's thinking about these objects uh, through line, through drawing in two dimensions, and then here embodied in three dimensions. And then, of course, the really important thing to say, um, and this is really my job is for the introduction, is that wonderful though this 15-year period at Vanini is, it is just the beginning of a career. And after he finishes at Vanini in 1947, um, he turns then full-time to architecture, and that's really what he's best known for. And I've known Scarpa's architecture for a number of years, but um, the glass, I knew about it, but this was a revelation to see this, this a range of objects when I saw the exhibition in Venice. Um, but Scarpa's not a sort of normal architect. He doesn't really build that many buildings. What he does instead is to make these very subtle um, interventions and redesigns of museums and pre-existing historical structures. So here you see the first one, which is the um, Academia Gallery in Venice, and his um, settings for these two wonderful Giorgione paintings, The Tempest and The Old Woman. And the next project is the Museo Carrere in Venice. I mean, many of you will probably have seen these museums and seen Scarpa's designs. And so the way he's combining ancient and modern, old and new, um, this is the Palazzo Albertellis in Palermo, and this was actually praised by Walter Gropius as, quote, the finest installation of a museum that I have seen in all my life. And I think Gropius was referring here to these wonderful um, stucco lucido screens that you see behind, for example, here, this uh, Lorana bust of Eleanor of Aragon. So again, the way that Scarpa is combining um, monochrome and polychrome, objects in three dimensions with you know, something flat on the wall behind them to sort, of, to sort of animate them. And then this is one of, um, I think, Scarpa's masterpieces, which is the Canova Museum, the Gypsoteca in Pisanio, which is just outside the Veneto. And of course, one reason why perhaps Scarpa's work is not as well known as it should be internationally is that the bulk of his projects are, of course, in Venice or just outside in the Veneto. And so here you see the way that Scarpa designed this incredible setting using these um, corner lunettes, which I'm sure both Carol and Josiah will talk about, to create this raking light. And so the sculptures become like sundials. He's using light and shifting light and time to animate these um, objects and sculptures. And there you see a view of them with a rather stained ceiling. Um, this is extraordinary. And then again, here, um, the, the museum at Castel Vecchio in Verona using these um, stucco lucido, which just, it's a t an ancient technique of plaster, colored plaster, which uh, imitates marble, so it has this kind of luster. So again, using color to offset um, these fragments of sculpture. And here, his wonderful easels um, in the pre-existing historic fabric of the Castel Vecchio. And the um, Quirini Stampalia in Venice. The Olivetti shop, which is in St. Mark's Square, which again, you may have been lucky enough to see, uh, which he was commissioned to design for the Olivetti typewriting company. And, and what we wanted to do in the exhibition was to um, think through how Scarpa applies the lessons he learned at Vanini during this 15 year period to his architecture. So for example, the sense he gained of materials, of light, of transparency. And of course here, this is the wonderful um, tiled glass floor, which uh, he used for the Olivetti shop, which goes right back to the Marini Romani um, bowl that you saw before. And then finally, this extraordinary final project, which is, which is the Brion Monument, um, again, just uh, in the Veneto outside Venice, um, where again, he uses these wonderful either Byzantine mosaics set into the concrete 
you see on the edge in the periphery, or here, um, these wonderful screens of alabaster, which uh, transmit this translucent light um, through the concrete wall. Okay, so that's an introduction to um, Scarpa, and now uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce the two artists who will be speaking today, and who I think are um, uniquely qualified to discuss the multifarious aspects of Scarpa's work. Um, the first of those is Carol Bove, and um, yesterday, every time I wrote Carol, I kept writing Carlo, so I have to be careful of my Carlo and my Carol. Um, so, Carol Bove has achieved international acclaim over the last decade or so for her assemblages, uniting both found and constructed objects, which often employ museological modes of displays, such as pedestals. Like Scarpa, she has an innate sense of the different properties and potential of materials such as wood, metal, and concrete, and often juxtaposes them in striking ways. This past summer, Carol presented the Equinox, an arrangement of seven sculptures at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and currently on view is a series of large-scale sculptures she created for the High Line, which runs until April 2014. And forthcoming is an exhibition of her work alongside um, pieces by Scarpa, which opens at the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds. So she'll be actually dialoguing with his work. Her work has been exhibited widely, including major group exhibitions such as Documenta in 2012, the Venice Biennale in 2011, the Whitney Biennial in 2008, and Unmonumental, the object in the 21st century at the New Museum in 2007, amongst many others. She lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. And then um, Josiah McKelleny, who'll be speaking after Carol, is an artist who has studied glass blowing and also deploys this to create an innovative and unique series of objects, assemblages, and installations, which merge historical reference centered on the legacy of modernism with phenomenological experience. Like Carol, his work addresses museological modes of display, and he aims to explore, as he aptly puts it, how, quote, the act of looking at a reflective object could be connected to the mental act of reflecting on an idea. McKelleny is also exhibited widely, including solo exhibitions at the Wexner Center for the Arts in Columbus, Ohio in 2013, the ICA Boston in 2012, the Whitechapel Art Gallery in London in 2011, uh, the Rena Sofia in Madrid in 2009, Moderna Mazit in Stockholm and the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 2007, and uh, one of my favorite museums, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston in 1999. He is a 2006 recipient of the MacArthur Fellowship uh, Program Genius Grant and currently lives and works in New York. So um, on that point, please uh, join me in welcoming um, Carol Beauvais to the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction and for inviting me to be here today. Um, this is, um, well, you know, part of the reason why um, Scarpa is not known, I think, um, more internationally is that we have not been ready for him. Um, and that Italy, or what, what I'm coming to think is that Italy was like really ahead of its time in thinking about um, presenting material culture and like thinking about how to present and, and transmit the information that, and of, of material culture and, and art um, from, from the past. Um, this is a, um, well, I'm gonna focus on talking about um, his, uh, Carlos Scarpa's um, museum renovations, and this is not really on topic. This is a, um, um, I, I'm, the Henry Moore Institute show um, that I will um, be in with my work and Carlos Scarpa's work is going to travel. The first uh, stop is gonna be in um, the north of Italy, in Bolzano, and um, then it will be afterwards in, um, in Leeds, um, and afterwards um, in Belgium. Um, but anyway, so I was just in Italy, I just got back a couple days ago, where I took this kind of incompetent phone photo in a um, <laughs> collector's house, there's a collector, and it's, okay, so the, the um, house was designed by Carlos Scarpa, and he bought the house with like all of the um, furniture in it that um, has been in it like since it was made, it's really amazing. And none of the entire house is black and white. The whole thing is in these kind of uh, complex pastels. Um, 
and, and structured along the lines of um, it's being in a vineyard. So anytime when a, a vine um, would pass through the house, would have passed through the house, had the house not been there, there would be like a fold in the fabric of the house or a color shift in the house. But, you know, not along with the colors although, or logic of the house in any other way. There's this screen that screens off the bedroom from the living room where you can see like every one of these panels can flip and then the, then the pattern would be like the diagonal would be going the opposite way. So you could remake the screen into like hundreds of variations. And you could also be in your bedroom and see what was going on in the living room and whether or not you wanted to go back to bed. Um, so uh, my, the, let's see, in the show, there's going to be um, some sculptures by um, Carla Scarpa. This is one of the sculptures. It's a detail. It's actually like a six foot long, um, six meter long um, copper sculpture. Um, I keep track of the time. Um, and this is about this tall. Um, and it has like precious stones and, and gold on it. And this piece spins around. Um, and these three pieces were presented at the um, Venice Biennale in um, 1968. And, uh, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, um, yeah, so anyway, that's completely off topic. Because <laughs> I have sort of like a, a little bit of a argument to make, which is that um, about his um, museum renovations. Um, and crudely speaking, the um, his general mo for the museum renovations, um, you know, was not to tear down, oh, it just goes through this period, these, without my touching it. Oh, okay. Is it gonna stay? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, anyway, is this a better, is this loud enough? Okay, I don't wanna, I don't wanna yell. Um, so his, his MO in the museum renovation um, and redesign was not to tear down the building and um, you know, rebuild a, a whole, um, but it would be to make adjustments to the, the fabric of the historical building. And um, some of the adjustments could be very comprehensive and structural, and um, others would be like down to the most minute detail, like how something like the color of the fabric. I'm sorry? Um, like the framing matting and the hardware and the um, screws down to the down to the most sort of mundane details would be like really exquisitely handled um, but even with the structural interpolations he gives you the sense that all of his additions are are layers that are sitting on top of a historical framework um, and then the artwork seem to be held in place on top of these um, exhibition desi um, devices and then suspended in relation to each other and then in relation to the historical framework. Um, right, so these are, I took from the, um, from Nick's PowerPoint. <laughs> um, this beautiful framing of, um, I like to, put this blue frame behind um, this sculpture. Like, it's sort of, you're not allowed to do that, you know, to, <laughs> to ha make a design strategy, an exhibition strategy in a historical museum that has that much personality with, period. But then especially without um, like calling attention to itself as like an authored gesture. Um, so anyway, these are all historical museums. They're, um, the physical buildings where history is told through objects and um, the display of the objects, how they're framed and presented, the sequencing and their positions suggest to the viewer what they are and what they mean. Um, The display is ideological, the architecture is ideological, what you choose to display, how you choose to display it, 
you know, which additions to the building that you choose to reject and which ones you keep. Um, questions like, can you justify rebuilding parts of a building to approximate how it was originally when it was first built? Um, and would that be fraudulent or, you know, would that be okay? This uh, acceptable, ethical. Um, this, the Canova Museum is sort of an exception in a way because it's really an addition to the museum. But um, that's what we're looking at here. But if you look at um, like Castelvecchio, for example, Castelvecchio was a 14th century castle that was on top of like 9th century um, structures. Which way is it? I'm, I know I'm going backwards, but I'm just sort of, I don't have them sequenced like. Um. So anyways, it was refurbished in the 20s. I don't have pictures of Castelvecchio at my fingertips here, but I think it should be coming up. Okay, so it was refurbished in the 20s in accordance with the taste of the time, which would be uh, that you would redo the, build, redo the rooms like as if they were um, in a medieval or renaissance mansion and then put all of the artwork on top. Um, so he, um, then it was badly damaged in World War II. So he worked with the director to, um, of the museum to remove the, the kind of considered fraudulent elements and expose the original elements. Um, he added all of the floors, a bunch of the stairs, created the flow through of the galleries, and added some external walls and um, extended the roof to cover um, um, an outdoor sculpture. Let me see if we have it after Olivetti. Um, anyway, if you're telling the story of um, through history through material culture, through art and objects, these objects are your evidence. That's Castelvecchio. Okay, those are like some of the original um, frescoes. And then some of these beautiful um, easels that he built to, um, um, for the paintings. Um, so anyway, you have to deci make decisions about what evidence, historical evidence, to suppress and what evidence to support. And you might be thinking, like, why would you have to suppress evidence? That sounds terrible. But ultimately, you can't um, present all of the evidence because, um, for example, you couldn't show a room as it was done in the 20s and show the original frescoes because, you know, one is just in conflict with the other one. One would have been on top of the other one. Um, you know, you can't show a painting with all of the damage it's accumulated over time and show it how it might have really looked when it was first made. There are two conflicting pressures on, um, on the conservator or the pre presenter, the, re um, the restorer. And on the one hand, the restorer is responsible to the, the aesthetic unity of the work of art as it was originally intended. And on the other hand, um, it, he or she needs to show its historical nature and the traces of the history that, that history's left on it. Um, and the restorer has to acknowledge his or her intervention. So um, I wanna do a couple of quick quotes from um, Cesare Brandi, who's like a really important art historian um, from Italy, born um, the same year as Carlo Scarpa. And um, he was a conservator. He's really uh, a really important, influential conservator because he um, was, uh, he became the head of restoration at the Institute in Rome under um, uh, fascism where conservation throughout Italy was formalized as a discipline, standardized, and he, his, his thinking on, on conservation was the foundation of, of their um, work. Um, and, okay, so he, here's a quick quote. Um, Restoration is the methodological moment in which the work of art is appreciated in its material form and in its historical and aesthetic duality with a view to transmitting it to the future. 
And then there are these two axioms um, a bit later on. One, only the material form of the work of art is restored. And number two, restoration must aim to reestablish the potential unity of a work of art as long as this is possible without producing an artistic or historical forgery and without erasing every trace of the passage of time left on the work of art. Um, Theory of Restoration was first published in 1963, but um, I think it's the distillate of his thinking for the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And um, um, anyway, the fascinating thing about, um, I, when I learned this, I, it kind of blew my mind. So in, in the 30s, um, um, conservation was formalized as a discipline with consistent rules and, and ethics throughout um, Italy. And in the rest of the world, in the United States, it was um, formalized in the 1990s, um, which I think is just so shocking. So that like from institution to institution, like so at the Washington DC Picture Gallery, um, they could have sort of the idea that it was better to not have impasto on their paintings and sort of make them all flat and then varnish them. And that was like acceptable. Um, protocol and um, they did that and like at Yale they had a program of like taking all of their early Italian paintings this is in the 50s and 60s and um, removing all of the um, um, restoration work that had done been done bef in the period in between 1950s and whenever they were made in the 13th century 12th century um, just removed it and like left them as kind of archaeological fragments. Um, but in Italy, they already had this um, this theory that actually is the formate the sort of the foundation of um, conservation theory internationally um, by Cesare Brandi. Um, anyway, when I was first introduced to Carlos Scarpa's work in museum renovation by Nick, by the way. Um, I was shocked um, because you know he was working on these ideas that I'm working on now, but he was doing it 60 years ago, um, like setting up these elaborate sculptural frameworks for historical artworks um, done in this late modernist language. And um, yeah, I mean, as I said earlier, you're, you're just not allowed to do something like that with so much personality in museum display. Um, especially not with like the explicit authorship, but he did do it. And, um, and it wasn't just like in the backwater, like someplace where nobody goes to with some paintings nobody cares about, but it was actually, you know, in um, Venice with like um, Renaissance masterpieces. Um, anyway, so in order to do that, a person would need to have a lot of support. I think it, culturally it would have to make sense to people. Um, and so I think there, uh, is like some kind of, I was gonna say that like, not to diminish his, his genius um, as an individual uh, artist, but sorry, these are some amazing pieces of hardware he designed. <laughs> but okay, I'm going over, I'm sorry, this is it. But just that the idea that there's um, other, um, there's like a cultural, situation that he was in that made his work make sense in Italy. Okay, thank you. I love this, this Venn, Venn diagram. Um, I'm Josiah McElhinney. I uh, just want to say thanks, thanks to the museum for inviting me to um, participate in, and learn today from other people who are also been so captivated by Scarpa. Um, I'll just um, go through quickly a kind of just history of my involvement with Scarpa and try to just have a few comments during that about what, what excites me about his work. Um, I first, I went to Venice in November of 1987 and uh, was, somebody told me about this bridge, which what stuck in my mind is I think other than the paintings in the academia as being my, mo the most, my most favorite thing that I saw in Venice, this small bridge that Scarpa made. And I guess that from my, m to my mind, uh, 
it's a, it's a structure that begins not with the broad structure, but with the small structure. So it begins with hardware and builds out from there. So it begins with how joints function on the smallest scale and builds forward from that. And I feel that that's a, a key element of who Scarpa is and makes him quite unusual. And then, of course, the Olivetti showroom uh, on, on the plaza in uh, San Marco. And then um, my first sort of uh, direct uh, inspiration from Scarper's work came from this photo, uh, which was published in a book, a survey of, of Biennale um, exhibition design uh, that was published, I think, in 1995. And I was really struck by this, these structures in the back. My, my theory or my belief is that these were designed by Scarpa. There's from the 1952 Venice Biennale in which the Biennale up until 68 was a combination of, of art exhibitions, architecture exhibitions, applied arts and decorative arts all together in one exhibition. It's only split, that is only split up after 68. Um, and people have told me that it could perhaps be a different designer named Fulvio Bianconi but because of the hardware and also actually the kind of various suspension strategies, like how planes float, I feel really confident in saying that there that this was made by Scarpa. This is an example of a of a photo of it, of how it's built. It has this magnificent little tiny piece of hardware at the top that slots on and holds in three different directions the piece of glass. But then the whole thing is like a house of cards, and the glass never meets each itself, and the whole thing is only held together with these two little rods. So basically, it's just just holding the whole thing in tension. Um, so I thought that there was something so incredibly evocative about the kind of status of these objects floating above this plane, floating in this this box of tension, that I um, wanted to um, uh, to reenact this. Uh, experience. So I made a, a project that was specifically about the um, about the some real events in in Venice in which uh, the factory workers crossed class boundaries. This is called from an historical anecdote about fashion, and it it purports to be it has this kind of authoritative um, museum display and historical uh, let's say ephemera that's included in it that makes it look like it could have been from the 52 Venice Biennale. And um, it includes this, this uh, set of objects that are intended to look like 50s Italian objects, has the original Vanini logo. And, but the difference is that each of the objects is actually based on a specific design by Christian Dior from between 47 and 52. And um, it comes from this anecdote, which I'll tell you very, very briefly, which had to do with the Vanini factory. And in this, uh, this piece of ephemera, which was some book pages that were in, uh, on frames on the wall, which um, copied the exact design of the book that had recently been published on the Vanini factory, a kind of catalog resume. And, but these, this fake story and these fake photos of Paolo Vanini's wife, uh, Jeanette, uh, walking through the factory wearing a Christine Dior dress. And it had to do with um, a true story in which uh, one of the workers made um, a vase uh, at lunchtime based on the dress she was wearing. She, she was very involved with running the factory with her husband and was, was a Parisian and often went back to Paris to buy um, fashion and came back when would be seen wearing this in, in, uh, in, in the office, in the factory. Um, as just a kind of side note, no women were allowed ever on the factory floor. Um, so I don't believe she ever was actually literally allowed to go onto the factory floor, but only, only to the office. It's a very, very sexist um, structure. Um, and then it had like this uh, fake catalog pages of the famous uh, Catalogo Blue, which is a kind of uh, uh, blueprint catalog of all the models of the Vanini factory. And um, so this was obviously using as many elements of real history to kind of create a convincing, or at least fantastically convincing, um, experience of this idea of culture crossing class boundaries, the idea of, of the working class factory worker 
uh, co-opting or, or, or re reusing or um, appropriating perhaps uh, the, the, cultural, the cultural life of the upper class. Um, as a side note, they, uh, the workers really hated her. Um, they were all communists and she was not, and she was also not Italian. Uh, by the way, it was her mother who told me that. I mean, her daughter who told me that. Um, I, otherwise, I would never say that, um, I, have, would, having no firsthand knowledge. Um, then, after that, I became really kind of obsessed with uh, the way in which he combined the forms in which he made with the exhibition structures. So these, this is actually the Capeline factory. Um, these are all, these next few pictures are all from the Milan Triennale, which is a really fascinating um, design expo uh, in Italy. Uh, these are also, I believe, Capellin. The, the overlap of, just as a kind of nerdy fact, the, he, he worked at a factory before Vanini, but that is, is kind of half Vanini factory. So it's there, I don't personally make any particular distinction between the two. And I, for me, these works kind of exist, for me, in these historical pictures, in these displays. And I feel like that their meaning and their their hopes and desires actually are encapsulated within this situation as opposed to the individual objects. Um, one of the interesting things I was just told, I was on a panel with somebody, an historian from Harvard, who said that it's very likely that much of this work was paid for by the Italian government. Um, so that, and what is interesting about Scarpa is that that he, I think Carol is exactly right, we, were, we weren't ready for him. I mean, I don't think that his, these works that he made in the early part of his life were really more or less forgotten until the 80s. Um, I mean, for certain people they were important, but they were never produced in large numbers. And their biggest impact was in these, in my opinion, in their, these original displays, which were an attempt to ex expose how Italy could use its history and, and yet be modern. Or at least that's my understanding of the kind of goal of these exhibitions, because they were, inter they were all international exhibitions. So I made some works that were inspired by these displays. So like, this is called uh, Charlotte Perry and Carlos Scarpa, some others white. Um, and this is kind of takes his glass objects, remakes them in white, and then kind of encapsulates them in this incredible um, structure designed by uh, Charlotte Perry and in, I think also actually 1952. And then this is a much later work that I made. Uh, I mean, that last work was from 2000 and this is from 2011, I think. And this is called um, Charlotte Perry and, and Carlos Scarpa Blue. And in, when I made this work, it was really trying to understand how we think of this, we associate modernism at oftentimes with the notion of um, uh, efficiency, of logic, of uh, rationality. And what I think Scarpa is an especially beautiful representation of is, is how the modernist uh, mode of thinking could be so influenced by, by both by history and by local uh, experience and to be very idiosyncratic and individual. Um, but I guess uh, uh, 10 years later, I was thinking about something quite different, which was, and I, which was the fact that uh, this kind of sexism within the history of, of modernist design in which uh, the women designers, the women architects, were often uh, relegated or assigned the unimportant, quote unquote, thing, which was the decor, the furniture, the objects that inhabited um, architectural structures. And uh, so I have made a whole series of sculptures that in my own perhaps ridiculous uh, attempt to um, at compensation uh, to reverse that process. So this is um, this is Charlotte uh, Charlotte Perriand as the architect, and the male architect is inhabiting her structure. Um, and as well as this, like this structure is claimed absolutely falsely by the the Prouvé estate, um, and which is also sort of uh, something that I mentioned because I, I it drives me a bit crazy that that these male architects still want to deny the, the uh, 
the creative history of these amazing women designers. And then this, um, this as we've all been talking about, the Gipsoteca in Pisano, Italy, which has um, all these plaster uh, casts and models for Antonio Canova, and I highly recommend looking at the Canova exhibition in which you can actually see some of these plaster models here right now, quite fantastic examples of relief sculpture. Um, but I was really captivated by the idea of uh, today, what is the potential of a model? So something that's in scale that implies an imaginary um, larger version of itself. Uh, and so these ones here in these cases that are, um, these are approximately 25% scale models of, for larger, large studies for larger works often. And um, so I returned to Scarpa in part because this idea of um, uh, his, these, these vitrines seemed always to me to be like a figure, you know, sort of like a, a torso and two legs. And um, I, again, going back to the bridge, they, these things are built in a very uh, precarious way. They're, they're barely held together. They're actually uh, held in tension with a little piece of wire. Um, and even the, you can see the way, in this case, the ones that have the single legs, the way they sort of balance and float, again, seemed really um, exciting to me. But in this, in this instance, I was interested in this idea of the figure itself. And so, um, and this is an example, again, of the vitrine within the vitrine within the vitrine. Um, so I think, for me, uh, the vitrine at, is, exemplifies a question, the questions of scale, and scale is only, in my opinion, can only be measured by the body. Like, that's the only actual measurement of how to scale something. And that the vitrines and, um, and the architecture of a museum can help you to understand the scale of your own body in relationship to these cultural works. And I think Scarpa is this master at recognizing that and, and structuring an experience of that for us. So I made a series of um, sculptures for the past couple of years. Uh, these first ones are all called Models for an Abstract Body. And so this was a sort of an attempt to make a sort of mini museum of figures within figures, essentially, uh, inside uh, just a, 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 the classic white cube gallery. And I tried to, uh, with some friends and collaborators, um, um, uh, uh, Jim Cantor and, and uh, Will Enzo, we tried to, uh, to come up with a way of reconstructing these designs to preserve as much as possible of, of the original uh, quality of the Scarpa's design, but actually making them a bit more practical insofar as that the ones in Pisano are, are never moved, so they're, they're assembled once and <laughs> sit there ever since, so these can be, these can be moved. Um, and this, for example, is called uh, Models for an Abstract Body after McQueen. So these are objects that kind of purport to be a kind of 25% scale model of, a, of a, an object that could be worn, a dress, or a kind of costume. Uh, and they are made with a kind of moiré effect to try to kind of, in this very, very low-tech way, um, imitate movement and cloth. And then this one is called Models for an Abstract Body after Delaunay. So these are... Uh, objects based on drawings by Sonia Delaunay uh, from the 1920s, some of which were fashion designs, some of which were designs for uh, a ballet. And yeah, I guess, and the overall, I guess, to me, this idea of vitrine as the figure uh, is still a very evocative notion. So thank you very much. And now I'd like to invite uh, Josiah and Carol to join me on the stage for a conversation. Okay. Thanks, that was great. Okay, um, is this on? Can you hear? Yes? Good. Um, thank you both for two really fantastic and interesting um, presentations. I think the first question is really straightforward and simple, and you've so, sort of addressed it, but I just wanted to kind of reconfirm. And it was how you both first encountered um, Scarpa's work, and in what manner, whether it was you know, uh, in the flesh, in Venice, through reproduction, whether it was the glass, the architecture, 
Um, Carol, do you want to speak first? And, and what effect it had on you? Um, I mean, I had heard about it, but it wasn't, I, it didn't, um, I didn't get it. <laughs> you know, when I had seen it in pictures, I didn't get it. And yeah. then um, it was you who brought me to see the, um, we went to see the career and the Olivetti, and then we went to Brion, which was like life-changing. I mean, the whole thing was really life-changing. I mean, it really gave me permission in a lot of ways. Well, first of all, it blew my mind. But then it gave me permission to do some things that I, I didn't talk about, but that I had, um, I don't know, it gave me a sense of freedom. Well, like the idea that, um, you know, putting display strategies aside, which I'm very interested in, and he's like the total master of putting that aside. Um, the idea that, um, you s that he um, does shows at Brian that you can be like just so inventive, like that as an architect, and still seem really disciplined. Because I'd always really associated like discipline with you know remove, uh, remove and then um, just you know parsimoniousness. <laughs> and that, yeah, that you would always have to return to a theme, you know, if you like presented a theme. He never returns to a theme, you know, it's just like, well, here's, th here's this crazy thing. And you're like, oh, that's amazing. And then there's like another thing in the next um, pavilion that's harmonious, but like really takes it to some really other place, you know, and like it, it makes a really big psychological space where you can always enter, yeah, these, these different pavilions and different, like the texture is so heterogeneous. I wasn't very articulate about it with this person's house, like talking about the house with the screen, but it was like the whole place was done in these pastels, but then there's like these insertions of like really like other types of materials and other sets of colors and other concerns, just like as if like one, um, He's just not stingy, you know? <laughs> Generous. <laughs> yeah. And there's something very organic about his work as well, the way it unfolds in, in space right. as you experience it. Yes, organic, but, yeah, like organic, the way a mind is organic, where you're the, yeah, the nature of your mind to have thoughts, you know? <laughs> they, can have, they can have different, all different textures. Like, they don't have to be, like, what you necessarily imagine is organic, which is, like, you know, um, biological. Exactly. And, and Josiah? Um, well, as I mentioned, I, my first encounter with Scarpa is that bridge, and um, I guess that to me, like what you spoke about the the um, the plaster uh, imitation of marble, I think that somebody who cares about and builds a structure based on a, on his feeling of for a material, like his actually sense of that that would set off this painting in this incredibly respectful and, and vibrant way. And like in that bridge, when you look at the things that makes a separation and like there's a sense of, um, yeah, like uh, joy or kind of uh, desire for, for uh, a very simple thing that, that anybody can kind of uh, find accessible. So I, you know, as a grand architect to look at a, a 10 foot long bridge as a masterwork was very, uh, felt very, as a young person felt very accessible. I think one of the joys of discovering Scarpa in Venice is that um, probably he's not the reason that you're there to look at things, that you're, you're going there to look at kind of, you know, Renaissance paintings or mm. Gothic palazzi, and you discover Scarpa in the process, and even some of his work is actually meant to be essentially invisible. It's mm. a setting or a prop for something else, which I think is really interesting. Um, my second question is a statement, so I've just broken my own <laughs> rule, but um, I just want to read this quote by Scarpa because I think it... Um, it addresses your own work in, in interesting ways. And that's what I really want to do is to draw out, you know, discussions of your, your work as well as um, Scarpa's. So here's the quote. Um, I would rather, on the whole, build museums than skyscrapers, though logic may say otherwise, since the former may perhaps be creative, while the latter requires one to adapt and subordinate oneself to things as they are. It can be very important for the presenter of works of art to have a critical appreciation of them, because presentation can be a form of interpretation, of drawing attention to collocation. And so this made me think about how the bulk of Scarpa's career is actually defined by um, pre-existing or preordained parameters, whether it's the conventions of glass blowing or uh, interventions within a kind of you know, existing historical structure. And it made me think of both of your work, the way that you work within those structures, but then find a way to also um, either overcome them or uh, subvert them. And so I just wondered if um, 
you wanted to talk about that idea at all, with your own work or Scarpa's work? Was that a question rather than a statement? <laughs> I think it was then? kind of a question. It was, <laughs> kind of makes me think about like his relationship to um, like conventions and rules, which is like it really so remarkable that he never took the test to become an architect. Mm. You know, like his work is so bound in the idea of like tradition, like like um, he seems so drawn to like working with art history and to and then to working in these museum settings and to like thinking deeply about how do you transmit the like information of the past or the you know art and material culture of the past into the future but then that he couldn't do the most follow the most basic convention of like becoming an architect which would be to take the test you know so it seems like like he's ambivalent in a way about the rules like there's like this like a passionate love for them but then <laughs> you know like or you know maybe it just comes down to just not being a very practical person you know like a, um or 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 not having an architect's temperament like somebody who would um you know he doesn't want to like build something whole but he wants to like interpolate these like fragments into the whole that suggests a different kind of whole you know, it doesn't really answer your question, but a little it bit where it's like the idea of like being being like so inside that you can't actually enter the the tradition or something. Does that resonate within your own work, your own practice? To use a word I don't like very much, but just the idea <laughs> of presentation as a, as a mode of uh, creation, if you will, or um... yeah, definitely. I mean, I think also that moment of like or the the power that's that can be in not power, but um, uh, <laughs> um, when you um, make that encounter in a, in a exhibition setting very um, clearly palpable, present that you're like that the object in the in the room knows that there's something, somebody, a consciousness looking at it. So that there's like that kind of like almost like the like super austerity, the kind of like real, just assiduous relationship to the rules and conventions, like makes the rules and conventions seem like sort of like um, so present that it, it almost seems like it has, a, a, it's conscious, you know? So you're then as a viewer conscious of being in the exhibition space. And Josiah, the same, do you want me to, shall I go back to the question or? Uh? <laughs> It was just about this idea of, of, of presentation, modes of, you know, either museological modes of display or um, of, you know, even merging fact and fiction as you do in your work. Well, I guess two things strike me from both what both, what both of you said. One is just that as an Italian person, I think he expresses really well what any Italian understands, which is place in a way that, and especially the place of culture within place. So, like, as a just sort of very... Uh, perhaps a prosaic example, when you see a Caravaggio painting in a church, and let's say it's 90 degrees to the main axis of the church, and it's, you know, it has a particular relationship to the light of the church and the whole procession of entering the church and what that means within Italian culture or culture broadly, like that experience is something that every Italian um, has kind of built into them. And it's like specific, specificity, <laughs> if I can get that phrase out. <laughs> well, the meaning of it, like yeah, the meaning yeah. of, that, that things exist in a place and that actually that, that we, if we try to uh, erase that fact, we, we lose something very essential. And so he's, I think that that's one of the reasons why he's interested in display because basically you can't look at culture without display. And so how does, he's trying to create place, in my opinion. Like, I think that's one of the things that he's daring to do, as you, you spoke so well about, that he, that it seems so rare. Um, but the other, the other thing that I was going to say was that, to me, and, and, and I, you know, I'm curious what you would say about this, like, for me, I've always often defined the notion of display as a, a process rather than an image. So I've been really interested in, for example, like the classic thing of like looking at an old book of exhibitions, like exhibitions disappear, they're often temporary, and you're left with this image. And oftentimes it's very uh, romantic and evocative and, and represents some kind of like, like overblown maybe image of what, what they're trying to achieve. But the reality of an exhibition or any art 
uh, uh, art exhibition, for example, is that you, you enter at one moment and you see one thing and then you take two steps farther and how fast you do that affects the experience of it. And then once you do you stop again and then do you look more and then do you go to the end of it and then turn around and then do you, do you get closer to things, do you get farther away? And maybe that sounds all very simple and basic, but to me, that's how I, that process is actually how I experience any art. And it's, it's like a, it's an unfolding uh, narrative. It's like a play. And I think that uh, surprisingly, again, I think one of the makes him so unique is that he's, he, I believe that that's part of how he thought about the, the, the exhibition design process was to create one place, but also a kind of unfolding experience that actually has to do with one's own exploration and experience of the body over a period of time. And I think for me as an artist, and maybe, maybe for you, I don't know, that that's been a really important question of like how to think about that within like this time of, of images. Yeah, 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 definitely. Actually, that's a very important part of his work that I didn't have time to touch upon, but it is the exhibition design, which he really did a lot of, you know, for the Venice Temporary Biennale. Temporary exhibitions. Exactly, yeah. yeah, as well as, you know, museums. And so that, that's the more um, transient aspect of his work. Then the next thing I wanted to um, bring up in, in terms of Scarpa's work, but again in relation to your own, is this idea of the monument. And I'm thinking here about um, the Brion monument, the Brion Memorial, which we looked at briefly, or um, the very beautiful monument in Brescia, which was done in the 70s um, as a memorial to a bombing by the Brigati Rossi, the Red Brigades. And I was thinking about this in terms of um, the kind of belatedness of Scarpa's work, this idea of almost his work being a monument to modernism as well as to earlier periods and the way he telescopes those things. And of course, both of your work um, deals in different ways with the idea of the monument. And so I wondered if you wanted to talk about that. Enough. <laughs> <laughs> you can pass on these questions. <laughs> yeah, I think that's an interesting question, but I don't... Do you, do you uh, think the monument applies to your work or not? I mean, not, not monumental, but the idea right, of the monument. Right. Time. Time. Yeah, time. And, but I... Yeah, I don't know. Like, there is, like... I always imagine that my work is going to spend more time like moving around or sort of like being in a box or you know like <laughs> that it, that it has like a life that's that's a little bit more transient than than like architecture typically you know maybe maybe that will all change <laughs> but um yeah it, I, and i think because i'm thinking about this this type of um pace or this this type of of life for for the artworks where it's like based on exhibitions and and going into collections and moving that i'm thinking about a much quicker type of um time scale of time where i where although i i love thinking about time and i'm practicing thinking about longer um periods of time and but i think carlos scarpa was so masterful at being a part of his time but being detached from his time and being able to see that like what he added to a museum for example would be like sort of i mean he even talks about this in an interview about like how time would make it into a whole you know and like he sort of builds in a way that patinas will unfold so it's like he's really thinking he's able to think about like 500 year spans like sort of on either side and that he's sort of like suspended in this present moment. And it's very, it's, it's palpable in seeing his work, it's so amazing. Right, the idea of the monument or time in, in your own work as well as Scarpa's, or is that important to you? I don't know a lot about his, the, these monuments that you're referring to, but I, I guess that the one thing, in this question of time, um, we often think of modernism as a, like an historical period, and you know, that has a kind of beginning, an arc, and a kind of quote unquote ending. But I think that one of the things that somebody said to me um, uh, in the early aughts was, uh, well, actually, we thought modernism happened, but maybe it really hasn't happened yet. And I thought that like <laughs> your, your work is also an ev evocation maybe of that, and that Scarpa, in, in the, in, we, we bandy this term timelessness, but basically I think that he's able to create something that that isn't fixed in its time, even if it ages. And I think that that's why some of like the things that he did 
for example, in the early 30s that looked like they could have been made in the 90s. Um, and I, and I, it's not just about him being advanced, it's about some other awareness he has that allows him to not just, let's say, reflect the fashion of the moment. It's quite tired, it's without. I think that's really right. And then the, the, the next um, issue I wanted to tackle is kind of adjacent. It's about the idea of um, anachronism. And again, both in Scarpa's work, which is obviously um, ever-present, the way that he juxtaposes old and new and, you know, different materials. And in terms of both of your work, so, you know, Carol, for example, um, this wonderful piece that you have, the, the tabletop piece called uh, La Traversée Difficile, where disparate, incongruous objects are juxtaposed. And then Josiah was thinking about your wonderful installation um, for the Art Institute of Chicago called History Modernized in uh, 1998, where you paired the historic objects with um, kind of contemporary, your own reconstructions of them. And so I was just thinking about this kind of shoehorning together of um, objects from different times and how you, uh, and, and in terms of Scarpa's work as well, if that's something that strikes you as resonant for your own work or anachronism. You can go first this time. <laughs> um. Well, I guess it, I, I, I could just tell, as a response to that, just tell an anecdote about that experience. Uh, I, was, I was invited to do what I've done a number of times, and many artists have done now, uh, including to great effect here, uh, like by Kara Walker, um, to intervene in a museum collection or, or do something within an historic collection. And at the time, I was invited by um, Ian Wardropper to do something with the Artist of Chicago, and... And I proposed this crazy thing, which I said, uh, take 500 objects out of this most popular section of the museum. And I just expected him to say no, but he <laughs> went ahead and did it. And um, I took 15 objects uh, that I chose from the collection and that I chose that I felt had some quality of modern to them, some aspect of that that seemed modern to me, just as a kind of subjective response. And part, what I mean by modern is like to my taste, uh, but also something that I felt like was accessible to me, like that I could, because many of the, the, the aesthetics of the past are actually difficult to, to understand, you know, to, to really feel as something that you uh, can place yourself in relationship to, at least for me. Um, so I did that and then I made a version, a sort of exact scale version of the same object, but where I tried to make it even more modern, you sort of make it sort of, to make it more available today. And I, I didn't expect at all what happened, which was that, that not only by the simple act of decontextualizing these objects, by I, not surrounding them with many, many other objects of, that were of like mind in a certain sense, uh, but also this, this placing of this kind of contrasting object, like so, for example, a very simple thing of making um, some form that's that was made originally in, let's say, clear glass, and then doing it in bright orange. Um, the, the original objects from, let's say, 1500 or 1600, they just didn't seem old anymore. They looked brand new. And I, I, had, I was completely taken aback by that effect, that, that, that in this very simple way, you could instantaneously uh, change one's perception of the, when an object uh, was from and what its status was in terms of time. And, and it's not just me who had that observation. I mean, many people said that same thing. Um, Carol, in terms of anachronism, uh, do you? Oh, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it, I feel like what, I, I'm not sure if this answers the question, <laughs> but it makes me think about in that piece you were talking about that I made with the tabletop that has different objects and then this intervention that you made at the Art Institute. Um, it makes me think about the sort of like digital consciousness that we are participate in now, where it's like anything can kind of be next to any other thing, but then actually letting it, and, and, and we have practice thinking about that, and we're forgetting how to not think like that, but um, in actually making it with physical objects, there's this like really interesting sort of flipping between sort of going, uh, um, seeing it in the real world, and knowing it's actually really there, and then sort of like this kind of like weird simulacrum experience of sort of like having the information of the things like intersecting with each other in your mind, in the abstract. It's so very it's very physical and abstract, or sort of like imminent, transcendent, you know, like it's... 
And it's a very contemporary way of thinking and operating, this I kind of digital disembodied mode of just yeah, everything being on a screen at the same time. Exactly, everything's digital disembodied, but then you encounter it as actually physically happening, which is like a really interesting kind of dissonant you know, experience. Um, but then, you, like, we were both, I think, talking at certain points about his work, like, you were saying with the, the vitrines, like, the floating glass, like, everything always kind of floats. Like, things are very physical, and you, you see, like, he's, like, things are so physical. He's so conscious of, like, the way that things have a texture and an internal texture and hardness, workability, like, stuff like that. But then everything is just sort of, like, held in, in relation as if it's, like, floating in space. It's really reminds me of this kind of um, digital consciousness in a real world. And then um, something else I wanted to address today, I think which is interesting in terms of the exhibition, is that um, the idea of either craft or design or ornaments and you know the idea of the artist versus the artisan, because of course this is an exhibition of um, design objects and utilitarian objects. And um, we were discussing before that the way that we're seeing them in the exhibition now is not necessarily how they would have been seen and perceived and you know used at the time i mean of course many of the the vessels which are downstairs were shown at the milan triennale this design fair or the venice biennale but they were made to be used and they were made as household objects so there's a kind of reification that's happening here and i just wanted to ask because both of you of course are artists but you um you either work with elements of you know craft design ornaments and how you feel about those um, perceived hierarchies and sort of vis-a-vis -vis maybe even um, an encyclopedic museum like the Met, the way that, you know, the way that different objects are, are given a certain status, whether it's a painting or a snuff box. Um, <laughs> I guess that I... Uh, that was five I, questions. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a symposium yesterday, and my notebook is in, at home, but I, so I can't quote who this came from, but somebody was saying that, that all art involves ceremony, and that actually, that part of the job of, of let's say, contemporary art is to re-invoke or to reconstruct different kinds of ceremony. And I, 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 that just suddenly came to my mind because if you think of what the Met represents, it represents actually many, um, not just like formal ceremonial objects, but many objects that actually have clearly a kind of ceremonial function in life in the sense of they have a place uh, in which that they are used interactively for something very important, you know what I mean? They're not, they're, they're, they're noticed, they're experienced. Um, and I think that for, in the modern world, that the exhibition and display is a kind of ceremony. And um, so I think that, uh, that, and what is the, in general, you know, in the 20th century, what is the um, intention of this ceremony? The ceremony is to evoke a kind of hope in a way, like a kind of vision of, let's say, sometimes progress or sometimes uh, fantasy or sometimes, uh, you know, a kind of um, utopian vision. Or So I think that to me that, that the idea that Scarpa was trying to evoke was actually not about this question of use value, but this question that objects could represent um, both the past and the future and that actually that they could resonate with, with in a very simple way by just sitting floating on a table um, and, and actually represent that complex idea of like what, how do we connect to the future and the past. And Carol, the idea of you know, craft or design or ornament in your own work? In, um, oh yeah, in my own work. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, one, well, one thing that I, feel like sort of sympathy with uh, Carlos Scarpa is like the, you know, I work with craftspeople who like will have like a, you know, a way of doing things that, that is like so specific and so involved. I mean, you know, you have this too, but like I, I have the feeling that you like know how to do the things that you do. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, but maybe not. Um, <laughs> but um, but anyway, I imagine his like. Um, sorry, I'm going to deflect this away from myself. But uh, that I imagine his like working with like in the glass, for example, with the people who are doing these crafts that are like really, really 
require like a, so much savoir faire that's like not you don't like read from a book it's like a craft tradition that's like has is completely linear you know like it need you need to learn how to make the form below the glass like from like lots and lots of experience but also from a person you know it's not like you know instructions it's like really it's really physical and then so then the idea that like he could come along and um Adjust, make adjustments in a way that somebody who's like doing the tradition wouldn't be able to do. So it really requires their sort of like sympathy and and cooperation. And and like I've been thinking about it sort of like dance or something. So like if you're a dancer, so you're doing like uh, a waltz, you know that has a form. You know maybe in the end you don't get a, an object, but it, it dance has a form and there's like a way that that it proceeds. And if you're like doing a waltz, you wouldn't just go like, like that would be ridiculous. You can't make that kind of adjustment. But like as a choreographer, you could say like, hey, I have this like insane idea. Let's like make these adjustments to this waltz or something, which is how I sort of think about his like working with um, in the in the glass and, and also with like, but then he brings that same kind of like, I, mean, I think like, you know, he works so closely with the glass um, makers at, at Panini uh, that he brought that same type of, process to his other work, you know, to making hardware, you know. I was like, so how do you do that? And it's like, well, what if you, you know, did this, like, other thing? And, and you know, anyway, I have this experience working with craftspeople where they'll make something, I'll be like, okay, close your eyes. <laughs> I'm going to, like, cut it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> do something horrible to it, you know, yeah. to, to change it into something else. But that push and pull is so important. Ooh, exactly. And, I mean, in some ways, his relationship to his collaborators seems so contemporary, the way that he's both within and without all of these objects, that he's there in the making, but, of course, it's not him physically um, crafting them. Then, crafting is a bad word, making it. <laughs> anyway, um, I think we've got time for one, I'll, I'll ask one final question before I turn it over to the audience for any other questions. And um, it kind of follows on, and it's this idea of um, tactility and phenomenology, and so kind of the scopic and the haptic in Scarpa's work, but again, thinking of it in terms of your work. And so, for example, those incredible images we saw um, in Palazzo Abatellis and the um, Castel Vecchio in Verona, where he places sculptures against these sheets of stucco lucido in color. And so it's this, there's the tactility of the sculpture, there's the kind of hapticness of the sculpture, and then the kind of scopicness of the mise-en-scene. And it made me think very much about the way that you orchestrate both your objects, your installations, and the way that everything is kind of framed and set. And I just wondered if you wanted to talk about that. So the, kind of, the, the, the sense of touch is really important to right. Scarpa's work. And the thing we can't do here in the exhibition is to kind of give a sense of the, the mass and the weight of the objects. I mean, it's almost horrible to have them closed in vitrines because, you know, the Mezza Filigrana weigh so little. You, I mean, I, I didn't get to touch that many of them, but um, <laughs> I'd get sacked. But <laughs> you want to touch them, you know? And so I just wondered how you, because yeah. with your work as well, you have that, there's that sense of, I always want to, yeah, I won't say I always want to touch your work. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's really nice, you yeah. know? And I think that like, well, what, it, what I think about with um, sculpture, like that, uh, with, with my sculpture, that it's, that this, Vision is more the secondary sense, even though, but you have to rely on it because you're not allowed to touch. And so you're relying on this, the sense that is not the, you know. Just to j jump in, so when you're, when you're making one of your installations, do you think of it as an image um, before, or, or it's more a group of objects and then the image arises from the objects? Or um, yeah, it's not, I think it would be like not an image. Yeah. Like it would be the way that you, that, it's the way that you look at something, I mean, whatever, it's just sculpture. It's like the way that you look at something <laughs> around. <or laughs> the yeah. fact that something, that you use your eyes to, to know something about the way something feels, yeah. you know? And, and then that there's like a series of, there's a series of views that result from like moving around the space, like you were saying. That, that it's, yeah, that it's like, that, I mean, what I always think about when I'm looking at big exhibitions are like, this exhibition is terrible. There's no bench. My feet hurt, you know? <laughs> like, just like very, like, basic yeah. concerns about the fact that you're not like, it's not pure visuality with eyeballs floating, floating around. It's, you know, that, you're, that you have a, that you have a body. In, in terms of your work, the kind of tactility. Uh, well, I was thinking, I mean, it's something I, I I don't understand it completely how tactility and, and looking function, but it occurs to me that like we one thing that is improving in terms of our expanding view of life is that we're starting to understand that this prejudice and what, what might be termed sexist prejudice against the surface 
is like is a kind of uh, yes uh, an, a libel against life in a certain sense, and that like when you were describing the sculpture against the the plaster, you know the 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 thing that I would propose is that unlike let's say later architects who might have simply painted that um, background and would have let's say just specked or suggested some whatever material for the wall is appropriate that you can paint it that that they didn't, weren't oftentimes weren't interested in surface and the surface is something is a way in which recognizing surface is a way of negotiating looking and tactility because when you stand in different places and move around it then you get all these concurrent views and you know it's sort of like going back to cubism or something that that all these different views add up to something if there is a surface there and if meaning is only in the structure of something and actually has no meaning within its material form, then you don't have that experience. You don't, you don't gain anything from moving around it in that sense. I think now we have 15 minutes left, so um, I might just turn it over to the audience if there's any questions, if you want to approach the microphones on either uh, aisle. We have someone here. Yes, um, I was wondering what role Paolo Scarpa's creations played in Italy during the fascist period. These are somewhat private pieces of art, and it seems striking to me that when fascism goes, he becomes a public artist, an architect. And this is there some issue here? And what connection did Vanini as an organization play with the fascist government, if any? Oh, good. That's my favorite question. Um, no, no, it's a really, it's a no, it's a really good question. It's a really important one because um, one thing. I mean, I, we of course the show came from Venice, and you know Scarpa's work is so well known in Italy. And but in the catalog, uh, in the original catalog from Italy, there was there was this wasn't addressed at all. I mean, there was no mention of the F word, and um, so we thought it might be kind of important. So I, I added an essay where I, I sort of talked about this, and. Um, and I kind of have a background in this in terms of my PhD and things. I mean, not in fascism, but in post-war Italian <laughs> art. <laughs> um, so it's, it's an interesting relationship. And of course, um, it's very difficult not to generalize. So, but it's pretty simple. I can kind of tell you more or less what it was. And so um, I think Scarpa is very unusual as an architect in that he actually doesn't really collaborate with the regime. I mean, most architects, well, maybe I shouldn't say most, but a lot of Italian architects helped build every post office and railway station that you see in every Italian uh, city, which are you know wonderful buildings, but ideologically fraught. And so I think one way that Scarpa was able to stay away from that was by staying at Venini. And what's interesting is literally, you know, 43, uh, I mean, there's this kind of lacuna at the end of the exhibition where a lot of the final objects are actually from 1943, but not made until 47, because Venice, although it's unscathed by you know, allied bombs and uh, it doesn't get the worst of it, the conditions of day-to-day -day life and production are becoming so difficult. And actually the Venini company was being told um, by Mussolini and the regime to just focus on making light bulbs to help with the war effort. So the fact that they're able to make anything at all in this um, environment at this particular historical moment is rather extraordinary. And so, um, I mean, Scarpa is definitely not a fascist, and, and uh, but you know, the, everyone was living through those times. And I think he, I think his way of, of avoiding having to be overly involved with the regime was to was to work for Vanini and to wait to focus on architecture until after that moment had passed. Does that answer the question? It's a really it's a really important question. Do either of you want to add anything to that? Uh, <laughs> or should we move no, on to the next? Like, yeah, you're probably the expert in that. <laughs> um, do we have any other questions from the audience? If you just want to go to the microphone, thank you. Um, mine's a kind of presentation question. I wonder if you think about the secret life of objects outside of the protective environment of the vitrine and the museum and the gallery and how they function as aspirational objects. So I think about the Louise Lawler photograph of the Pollock and above the soup tureen, and I think about my working class parents, how they displayed art or bought art and why, and how that relates to class and, and also to taste. Would you, either of you like to speak about that at all? Mm, class and taste, I don't know. 
want to take that on? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this, this, the, um, yeah. Um, well, I, I think the, the aspirational word was most most apropos. I, I, you know, one of the things that I was actually really curious about was some actual production figures, and I think you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that most of the objects you've seen are up there are models in a factory, right? So they have a model number, they have a catalog uh, place uh, place in the catalog, and the Vanini tradition was until. I believe 1974, when the sample factory, the sample room burned down, that that you could order a single, a single version of any model that they had produced in their whole history, which is a kind of absurd thing in terms of economics, but a kind of beautiful cultural notion. And so I think they were very aware of their own history. But the reality is, is that I think they almost made none of these things. I mean, I think they were in in essence many many of the models that were like that have a number for Scarpa were made once, twice, three times, like so, and yet that they, what, the whole thing was aspirational, like it's a factory, like it's not, it's it's based on a factory tradition, it's in a, it's in on an island with 8,000 factory workers at the time, it's, it's really about production and yet within the limits of, that they had um, technologically and, um, and it, maybe culturally, if it's okay to say that, like that, that they weren't actually compared to, let's say, for example, many of the other like aspirational um, uh, modernist efforts in Northern Europe where they're producing uh, models that are produced in the hundreds of thousands. It's a really, it's a very different um, idea. And I think for me that that, if you explain it like that, that it's actually, it's not the idea of making a single object. It's it's the idea of many objects, but it's only a dream. It's really <laughs> only a dream, and it, it, um, and I think that that's why they're one of the reasons why they're so um, idiosyncratic or kind of uh, they have so much character to them. Um, one of the things, like I would comment about them, is that so when you if you go to look at the drawings, one of the one one of the things that's lovely is to see the drawings that in my opinion, are almost certainly made on the factory floor and that are actually very, very general. Like, they're very nonspecific in a certain sense. And so they're, they're really based on the idea of, like, okay, they're, he's talking to the head of the team. They're all, only always working in teams. And he's talking to the head of the team and so like, do you get it? Like, do you see it? Do you see it in your mind's eye? Can you make this and do it this way? And yet there is a paradoxically, kind of on the flip side of that, there is a really amazing quality where throughout his work, everything, like I would describe it, is everything is squashed. So basically, if you take the original jade form he's echoing or comparable other modernist forms being made in Germany or Scandinavia or Czech Republic or in the United States, everything would be a little bit more elongated. And there's this kind of squatness that's very scarpa, and it comes through even in the most prosaic um, designs and like if it gets too squat it gets pretty lumpy do you know what I mean <laughs> and you can see that as well in some of the objects where some of them clearly like it got a little lumpy you know what I mean and so this is all I don't know if this answers the question but. that's great it goes, it goes to a good place did we um do we have any other questions otherwise uh we might wrap it up okay well um Thank you all for coming. Um, I hope you have time to see the exhibition now. We, we have half an hour before the museum shuts, if you haven't seen it already. Um, and please join me in thanking Carol and Josiah. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thank you. Great. Thank you.